to me, the goal, the spiritual goal of critical theory, critical race theory is to divide mm. and it is doing its job. Welcome to the Elisa Childers podcast. I'm your host, Elisa Childers, and I have a very special guest with me today. I'm going to bring my friend Monique Dusan in in just a moment to talk with us. Uh, she has founded the Center uh, for Biblical Unity, and you can find her website at centerforbiblicalunity.com. She's also one half of the uh, All the Things podcast, which is a great podcast that I just was a guest on. And she hosts that with Krista Bontrager, who has been on this podcast before. If you remember the episode where we talked about the the, the messaging of the group Mops, that was her her co-host there, Krista Bontrager. And so, uh, Monique, I'll just bring you on here to uh, to talk with us. And I'm so glad you joined me. We we've had such a great time. We've actually been chatting for like a couple of hours. <laughs> Yes. Before we come on here. So but it's good. It's all good. It is all good. But obviously, you know, we are at a really unprecedented time in our history as Americans. The racial tensions ha are so high and mm -hmm. there are all kinds of conversations going on right now. Um, I've been listening actually to, to several different conversations from Christians regarding racism in our country. And Oh, everything from listening to the experiences of people of color that are my brothers and sisters and, and what they've experienced and what they're feeling, the pain that they're in, um, the angst that they're feeling. I've been listening to some of those conversations. I've been listening to conversations of people trying to figure out what's the best way for Christians to to pursue justice in this mm -hmm. area, in our country. And those are all really valid conversations that we all want to have, um, but but our conversation has got a particular purpose. So we're gonna be talking about what I think a lot of people are feeling confused by, even paralyzed by. I, that's like just an example. I'll go on social media and it'll tell me as a white woman, you need to speak up. And then the very next post will say, you need to actually be quiet and not say anything. Um, Ask people to share their experience with you. Don't ask people to share their experience with you because it's not their job to educate you. Uh, don't protest, just preach the gospel. You have to protest or you're not a real Christian. Uh, it, it, you know, just, just today on Twitter, somebody posted a spreadsheet, essentially, that chronicles the social media news feeds of country music artists so we can keep up with who is... <laughs> using the Black Lives Matter hashtag and who isn't and how many times they've tweeted about this issue and everything. And so the pressure, the peer pressure to not just speak out, but to say a very particular thing is just immense. And, and I think that the one thing we want to establish is that as Christians, we all want to get this right. We all want to, to, we want to pursue God's justice. We want to define our terms biblically, and, and we want to spread the gospel because we know that the gospel is the cure for so much of what's going on, but then how do we apply that with our actions? And so, Monique, you have such an interesting perspective on this because I think you're going to be able to help untangle some of these knots for, for my listeners in particular who might be feeling the same way I have felt. So when I'm going on social media and I'm seeing some of these mixed messages, Help us understand what is that about? What is going on? Well, what you're seeing is part of a framework called critical race theory. And that is part of a larger framework that um, came down from critical theory, long, much longer story. But what you're seeing is this idea that white people are the oppressors and people of color are oppressed. And everything falls out of that framework. So if you are the oppressor, you shouldn't be asking people to educate you about how you have oppressed them. You're the oppressor, you should know. Um, you shouldn't be asking people, well, what is your oppressive experience like? You need to do the work and educate yourself, read the books. Um, you need to speak out against oppression. And the oppression specifically would be racism. And so you get terms like being anti-racist. It's not good enough not to you know, just to not be a racist. 
but you have to now ascribe to the idea that you are an anti-racist. And being an anti-racist means that you do the work. You speak out, you read the books, you believe the experiences, you know when you should use your voice and when you shouldn't. Um, there, there's a lot that goes into this idea of all the things that need to be done if you are white. Mm. To me, critical race theory is a very, it, it one, it flows as a, a framework or um, almost as a worldview. And I know people will like butt up against that or say, no, it's not, it, it doesn't, but it actually does um, work much like a worldview, even though it is called a theory. Mm. Um, but this this framework, as I'll call it, is definitely works based. So it's all about what you do, how you do it, in order for you to receive your salvation, so to speak, mm. or to you know be sanctified. All of the things that you have to do to get to a good standing, a proper standing. And so that's what you're seeing in society: is this you should be doing this so that I can approve of you. Mm. And if you're not doing this, then you're not going to be approved. And more than not being uh, being approved is you run the risk of being canceled. Mm. So part of this whole Black Lives, All Lives Matter is you need to be speaking out uh, um, along the lines that all Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter. That's fine. And no one is saying that Black Lives don't matter. But if you aren't ascribing to the hashtag and you come from a place or position of saying, you know, I really believe that all lives matter, including Black Lives, all lives matter, you're not doing it right. It's not the right way. That's not how you get to the good standing. Oh, and so if you it. don't get to the good standing, then you run the risk of being canceled. Yeah. Of being kicked out of the tribe. Right. And I think that's, that that seems to be what we're seeing so much is like this tribalism where, um, and I'm, I'm seeing like, I'm seeing my whole social media newsfeed like diverge into these two kind of really extreme camps. And, and so I want to ask you a little bit more about critical race theory in a moment, because I know that this is actually something you've walked through. You, pe you know, people might hear you give that definition, but they need to understand you fully believed this. Like you were yeah. all in on critical race theory before, you know, I, I'm not, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but how you would word it. But in a, in essentially like you believe God led you out of that, of that yeah, mindset. Definitely. And so I want to ask you about that in just a moment to kind of share with us that story um, but I know like just for me, one thing I've been really trying to do, you know, James tells us to be quick to listen and, and slow to speak. And so as all of this has been going down, I want to hear the, I want to hear what this is like for people and try to understand. So I feel like, you know, a good place for us to start, uh, at, at least for me, this is, this is what I've been trying to do is start from a place of empathy. So to try to understand what people are feeling. If, if, if my brothers and sisters are in pain, like I want to help them. And that's the one thing about this sort of extreme, just preach the gospel kind of message where there's almost no vertical level to the justice that, that I kind of buck against because I, I kind of thought of it this way. So it's like, if I'm walking down the street and I see a, a child being attacked. As a Christian, even just as a human, you know, my first instinct is going to be to help the child, to protect the child, to to stop the person who's hurting them. But you know, just to say, well, just preach the gospel to the perpetrator. You know, obviously nobody's really going to do that. So, biblically speaking, I think even logically speaking, there's like this vertical element of justice, and then there's this horizontal element of justice. And this is actually something that uh, Thaddeus Williams, who's a Biola professor, is working on a book on social justice that your story is actually featured in. Mm -hmm. And he talks about that, like there's this vertical element where justice needs to happen, God, you know, man to God, and then man to man. And, uh, and so we can talk a little more about that. Uh, but part of that for me, like I said, is just is trying to listen to conversations, trying to ask the Lord, like, what would you have me do? But it almost feels like from social media, like I'm not even really allowed to to take a moment and to be slow to speak. I have to say it within a certain time period, or else you know, or else you're canceled. And and so this is really coming from this idea of critical race theory. Tell us a little bit about your story. Like what what do you think led you into it? And then you know maybe we can talk about what it was that sort of opened your eyes to it that that led you back out. I would probably say I was born in it. 
so I grew up in South LA. I spent the first 15 years of my life in South LA. And I think conversations with teachers, what I would hear in school, what my parents would say, what my friends' parents would say, it was always just this idea of, you know, the us and the them. Mm. White people do this. Um, we are, you know, in this situation or, you know, it's the hood because of white people. Um, the whole Rodney King situation was, you know, happened and the riots happened when I was a child in LA. And so, you know, white people always think that they can do black people this way. Mm. And so it was just more of a frame of reference that I just knew, like, this is just what's true. It's been, it's what's been told to me. And so when I, when I went off to university, I went to Biola, which is a small Christian college out here. And I studied sociology and my professors reinforced this narrative, mm. but I didn't realize that it was critical theory or critical race theory until I got into university and started to really study this. Mm. And so I learned the the framework and the, the meat and bones to, to the framework in university, at a Christian university. Wow. And because they had the statistics, they had the name for it, they had purpose and reason behind it, I was able to fully grasp this and take that with me through my adult career and in social service and all of that until I, um, I went overseas as a missionary, came back home about two years ago and just really started to get in conversation with Krista, who you uh, mentioned earlier. And things, she began yeah. to to put a pebble in my shoe, so to speak, mm. and just got, got me thinking. And I mean, we had hard conversations because I came from this, this perspective of, you know, what you're saying, because it doesn't speak to the marginalization of Black people, because it doesn't speak to the oppression of Black people, because it is... Um, no, it, it isn't resonating with what I had always been taught or believed. It was a white gospel. So now she's mm. coming at me and talking to me about what I saw as being white and a white Jesus. Wow. And so we had many, when I say many, we had many conversations yeah. Yeah. about the fact that the gospel isn't white. You know, we, we have a church and a foundation that goes back way before the Reformation. You can look at the early church and um, the church in Egypt and, you know, like the Coptic church and things like that and how they had a foundation before the Reformation. Yeah. And that's something that that I was pointed back to, to and I began to investigate. How did the church handle these things? Mm. And that church wasn't white. Right. In fact, what did I, that you gospel said, say? You, I think you told me that you had met with, was an Egyptian who kind of helped open your eyes to some of these things. Because we hear this a lot. This is a, in fact, there's several uh, wonderful black apologists that are addressing some of these issues. Like, is Christianity a, the white man's religion and and that sort of thing? And so, uh, tell and us no, about, it's not. You know, right. there's this idea that we need to decolonize our mm, faith, mm. that, you know, the Christian faith as we see it today is the, the product of, you know, white Protestantism or Western European Protestantism. That isn't the faith, that isn't the gospel that we right. have received and we are called to preserve. There might be bells and whistles that we've added that that to the gospel that might reflect that. You know, we probably would agree with that, that there's, mm -hmm. there's aspects of the American church. Um, of course, in the American gospel movies talk about some of those kind of false yeah. narratives we've exported. And of course, the, the politicization of, of so many things would be so uniquely American, but the gospel itself, the core, the yes, bones the of the core. gospel is, is something that goes back for 2000 years. And so I want to talk about, you know, we're kind of titling this episode, The Gospel of Critical Race Theory, because one of the questions that I've received quite a bit from people is, I'm trying to understand critical race theory, but I can't, I, I just don't feel like I've internalized it. Like I'm trying to, un I, I see it and I recognize what I'm seeing happen in my social media newsfeed, but I'm having a hard time just like, like articulating it or understanding it. So what I think I'd love for us to do is maybe talk about the biblical gospel and then how that actually contradicts the gospel of critical race theory. Because if it was just an idea that you could add, you know, a good, a good common sense kind of thing that you could add, you know, there'd be no problem. But it actually really does contradict the gospel on many points. And so if we talk about the historic gospel, starting with creation, 
you know, people being made in the image of God. And I've heard you say this, like we, it, with all conversations about race and, and all of this, we have to start there that all human beings, no matter what your skin color is, all humans are made in God's image, in the image of a holy God. Um, and then, and then of course the problem, we can all look around and see that something's wrong with the world. That problem historically Christians have seen as being sin, right? So God creates man in his image. Uh, we choose to rebel against him. That sin gets passed down to us through Adam. And then of course the salvation plan of Jesus coming and taking our sin upon himself and dying on the cross and shedding his blood for, for every ethnicity, for all human beings that are made in his image. And then of course, raising from the dead and coming again to judge the living and the dead to an eternal destination of heaven or hell. I mean, this is the, the core gospel that Christians have believed for 2,000 years. And so maybe you can help us to understand when someone adopts the tenets of critical race theory, how is that actually contradicting that gospel message? When someone adopts the tenets of critical race theory, they're adopting a framework that says that man's original problem is whiteness. Mm. Like th this is, th we, as Christians, we believe that sin is the foundational problem among humanity. But critical race theory says, no, that's whiteness. White people, this white system, white supremacy, this is the reason why we are so messed up today. And the way to get rid of that is to become woke. It is to understand that racism is running rampant, that white people are... Um, The best way to probably say it would be that that white people are participating in systems that continue to keep people of color down. That this is what what humanity's fundamental problem is, and the way to receive your salvation to be woke and you sanctify yourself by continuously doing the work, the work of repenting um, from your racism, divesting yourself of your whiteness, reading the books, educating yourself, knowing when to speak, the lament. All of this is the way that you do you do the work, the way that you become sanctified, the way that you um, express your your, I guess, like the sorrow for for your sin of whiteness, solidarity in a way. Yeah, yeah. So it's but seems... this isn't what we see in the gospel. Right. This isn't the way that that we receive our our right standing, so to speak. Yeah, it isn't it isn't a works based faith. It isn't a works based religion. We are we are clear that the work of Christ is how we become in right standing. Yeah. But that isn't that isn't the case with CRT. That isn't the the way that you get there. You yes, they will acknowledge and say no, Jesus Christ is the way. And you also have to do these other things. Yeah. You know, repenting from your sins. So let's say, you know, you you are not safe, you convert to Christianity, and you, you know, you repent of your sins. Well, if you aren't specifically repenting of your whiteness and specifically repenting of your racism, then there's still more work to be done. Mm. Right. And so it, 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 it's contrary to, to the gospel. And, you know, people will say, well, no, it isn't, or it's just a theory. And, you know, as somebody who has lived this, I know that these are the things and the, the things that people think and the ways of, that the conversations go. Yeah. And it seems like it's sort of like everybody's united, it seems, that there's a problem. You know, I mean, you mm -hmm. probably have a, a few really extreme people saying racism doesn't exist at all. I mean, I know that racism exists. We know that it, it exists in our world. Um everybody seems to be really unified which, on that, which is such a great thing. And I think what I'm seeing happen is that with the lack of sort of strong voices giving Christians direction on how to engage some of this stuff, we're seeing these ideas of critical theory come out and say, look, we've got a solution. We're, we're all ready to go. Like we've got this total framework ready to go. And so I'm seeing a lot of Christians jumping on board with it. Um, and it, and it's sort of like, it, it's, I don't know, would you go so far to say is it's like another gospel? Yes, I would. I would definitely go that far. Here's here's the issue. Is that the church hasn't 
and this isn't to harp on the church, but the church hasn't historically hit on a lot of these issues, mm -hmm. these is the issues of racism mm -hmm. and things like that. And you get people who are just intrinsically justice oriented, um, who, you know, like some people are meant to be shepherds. Not everybody's an eye, not everybody's an ear, not everybody's a hand. We all display the character of God differently. We all have giftings that are different. And some people like me are created more with a, a justice mindset. Like we, I love to see like things equal and fair and, you know, but that's the way I've, always been. But when the church doesn't teach on the idea of justice and what that looks like in our current culture, how do we walk out how do we walk out these things in our current culture? What that leaves is room for things like critical race theory to come in because it'll say, "Oh, you are justice minded. I have the answer." Hmm. But it's not the answer. The church historically has been just this minded for the last 2000 years. Yes, yes, yes. But if no one teaches on it, then people like me don't know. And I, it, it's just the way that I was born. Yeah, it, kind of so reinforcing some of those ideas that you were, you were born with. Let's talk about words because we, we're seeing a lot of sort of buzzwords. And I, I, I really appreciate, there was this one conversation I listened to um, between four four guys, and they were all kind of defining races. All four of them had a different definition. And I think sometimes we can be talking past each other when we're trying to have conversations because we're actually coming from entirely different understandings of what some of these words mean. Like when I hear the word racism, and I think this is probably the classical definition, I, I, I think something like you know, judging someone or ele elevating their worth in your own eyes or demo demoting their worth and dignity in your own eyes based on the color of their skin or based on their ethnic um, background. Um, and I think that's probably close to the classical definition, but critical theory is actually, when they're talking about racism, they, that's not what they're talking about, is it? No, not at all. They are, racism, yes. It used to be the the guy who would burn a cross in your yard, The the lady who would use, you know, derogatory slurs or racial slurs and things like that. And now it's not. Now it's a conversation of prejudice plus power. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea that, you know, you you have this bias or this prejudice, but you also have power. And minorities don't have the power. We don't have institutional power, so we really couldn't be racist. So then you get into conversations on social media of, well, you know, she's so racist, or she's just, um, she's just showing her her whiteness, or her privilege is just coming forward because there's this idea of power, mm. and so those those words wouldn't be able to come to me because as a black woman in America, I don't have, or I'm not a part of that power structure. So essentially, according to the critical race theory definition of racism, like an African-American person can't be a racist. Is that Technically. Right? Yeah. So it's sort of just it, it it's and that's I think what a lot of people need to understand is like when we're using the word racism, we're using it in entirely different way. Entirely different ways. And when we you when when we say like, well, the African-American can't be racist that then gives room for people to participate in all kinds of unjust ways. Mm. Because, well, I, I can't be racist. Now I'm just exhibiting or exuding my hurt and my pain. Mm. You're, th this is just a byproduct of hurt and pain of, you know, years of mistreatment. And so- No, I, I can participate in sin. Racism is sin. It's the sin of partiality. Yeah. And so- what critical theory or what critical race theory does is says that some people can participate in a sin and some people can't. Yeah, that's that's, that's not, not gospel. Yeah, that is not that's not the gospel. And essentially, on the other hand, is this is that sort of definition why um, we'll hear people say things like, "If you're white, you are automatically a racist." Like it doesn't matter if you if you actually have those feelings toward other people. You could actually not be racist in your own heart and mind, but you are still a racist because you're part of this oppressive class. You're participating in an oppressive system, even without you knowing it. Just by virtue of the color of your skin, you participate in a system that 
perpetuates racism or um, injustice against people of color. So according to critical race theory, as a white woman, what am I supposed to do? What, you know, when I realize that, let's say I, I, let's say I go all in with it and I say, okay, I'm going to do the work. I'm going to, to acknowledge this about myself. What, it, what is it that I'm supposed to do? According you're going to educate race. yourself. Sorry, you're going to educate yourself about the experiences of people of color within the states. So Native Americans, Japanese, Chinese, Blacks, Latinos, you're, you're going to do the work. You're going to educate yourself. You're going to speak out against um, unjust systems within the states. You're going to work to dismantle those systems. You will, um, gosh, not ask you know, people of color what their experiences are unless you've been invited into that conversation because you don't want to re-traumatize people. Mm -hmm. um, but there's, there's just many pieces of work that need to be done when you truly awaken, so to speak, to your privilege, when you awaken to the idea that racism and injustice are the ways of America. And then, you know, with the Christian story, we're, you know, we're talking about points of of contradiction where the, the Christian gospel would contradict the gospel of, of critical theory. Well, you know, what, what I don't want people to hear and what I, th I think I see this extreme happening on social media too, is just like, almost like there's, there's one side of things where if anybody says like, Hey, I want justice. I want to stand up for my African-American friends who are in a lot of pain. And then everybody would be like, Oh, you're a Marxist or you've got, cr you know, critical theory. And that could be an overreaction too, because not every, a uh, Christian who's deeply grieved about all of this and wants to bring about change in whatever way that they they feel led to do that is is necessarily adhering yeah. to critical race theory. But on the other side, I've seen you know major evangelical voices say things like you know if you're crying about critical theory right now, either you know you're part of the problem, or I've even I've even seen tweets say that you know if you're if you're doing that right now. When when black people are in so much pain, if you're if you're calling out critical race theory, I've even seen posts where they're questioning your salvation. And boy, that's yes. a lot of pressure, right? I mean, and so like even as we're doing this, like I'm feeling that pressure. But my loyalty is first to God and His Word and what He says. And and so I think that even as Christians, we we have to call out these bad ideas, but we also have to highlight the beauty of the Christian answer for these things. And so the Christian, you know, the, let's talk about the word justice, you know, because we, when everybody who saw that video of George Floyd, that angst, that cry, that anger, that, that people felt, we felt that because we saw the image of God under the knee of someone else. And, and it mm -hmm. was, it, it's so deeply uh, offensive because we know that George Floyd was made in the image of a holy God. So let's talk about why we feel these things, biblically speaking. Like, what is the biblical definition of justice? Because that's something I don't really understand. When people are saying, like, I want justice, I think that they often mean different things. Like, they might mean, I want legal justice. Or they might say, mean, you know, I want maybe some, something more like revenge. Or maybe they mean, I want, uh, you know, people to... to have peace and it might mean it more of in a systemic sense. So what is biblical justice and how can Christians, you know, think about these things? Well, I think there are two pieces to, to biblical justice. There's the legal justice. So, um, you know, making sure that we have equal weights and measures when we are dealing with people in a legal stance, when we're judging someone. And then there's the justice that we act out one toward another, that we would, you know, treat each other kindly and fairly as we are in our dealings with one another. And then when when we aren't treating each other kindly and fairly in our dealings with one another, you then get the legal justice that comes in to help arbitrate some of those things. Like, you know, this didn't happen well, now I have to take it to the next step, which is the legal the legal side of things. But even in looking at the legal side of things, are we dealing with poor and rich equally? Are we dealing male and female equally? That is that is justice. It is looking at things from, from an equal standing. Now, when we move over into culture, I think culture looks at justice as equity, equality, mm -hmm. um, you know, making sure that we are feeding the poor, 
um, that we are, you know, speaking out for the marginalized. There's a lot that goes into justice regarding social justice. And so it depends on who you're talking to, because sometimes you can talk to a person about social justice and they're talk they're, they want to talk about, you know, the killings of innocent people. Other people want to talk about abortion. Other people want to talk about, um, you know, how we deal with the homeless and the poor. So on that end, social justice kind of runs the gamut. But I, what, I, what I believe truly is that on each side, there's a call or a cry within people that humanity would be treated kindly. Mm. And, but the way that we work those things out, if it's not worked out biblically, will just turn into more of a mess as we are seeing in our current culture. Mm. So let's talk about... Um, you mentioned a little bit earlier the concept of whiteness. And again, I think that when I first heard that, I thought they were talking about the color of my skin, whiteness. But that's not exactly what that means. And in critical race theory, what, what does that mean when we talk about whiteness? When we talk about whiteness and critical race theory, we're talking about the systems that allow white people to kind of go, go unscathed, so to speak, where Black people would be oppressed or not able to maneuver through those same systems. It's a system, whiteness would be a system of privilege. Um, it would be a system of white supremacy. Does that make sense? It does. And, and white supremacy is another phrase that gets a redefinition too, because classically you would think a white supremacist is someone who believes that the white race is superior to other races. But again, that's not what it means in critical race theory, is it? No, white supremacy is just the system that keeps white people on top and everyone else on the bottom. So let's say I work for an employer and he's white and he gives me a promotion. Under the thought of white supremacy, I'm only receiving the promotion because there's some benefit for him being a white man. Mm. It's always about keeping whites on top, even if it looks like you know, wow, you know, as an African-American woman, I received a promotion. That's awesome. The thought is, is that it's always going to be to the benefit of the white person. It's a system that just benefits and promotes whiteness. And, and so when, you know, often we talked about racism and, and I, we were kind of joking about this when we were talking before is like, I, you know, I've gotten emails from just about every shoe store and every, you know, business I've ever bought anything from online with their kind of their new statement now, uh, almost like churches taking a position paper on different things. And, um, you know, they'll run the gamut. I, I see a lot of critical race theory in a lot of them, but even in some that, that, that have kind of avoided some of that language, you still see this idea of systemic racism. So I want to talk a bit about that to help people understand what's meant by that term and uh, and because because if if we're going to define racism as as a sin, essentially first and foremost, a sin in someone's heart, right? Mm -hmm. um, then how does that sin get systematized? Because I, I don't think anybody would argue that you know laws can be passed that institutionalize that type of sin. And yes. so so talk a little bit about about that. So systemic injustice or sy systemic racism would just be a system in place within an institution like the prison system that would promote disparaging outcomes. So black guy and a white guy have the same crime. Black guy goes to jail for a sentence three, four times longer than the white guy, even if all things were equal. That would be something that, that's a system that promotes an unequal outcome. Right. Um, I'm still like I used to be so hard on, you know, systemic injustice and used to speak out a, a, a lot against systemic injustice. Right now, I'm, I'm rethinking my position on that. And, um, you know, where does where does this lie? Like how much of this is systemic injustice? How much of this isn't there? But there's a lot that can be said, you know, for systemic injustice. There's a lot of statistics that prove systemic. I can't even it's say it anymore. Say, it? <laughs> systemic injustice or systemic racism. But we also, you know, need to be wise. And as we look at those numbers and look at those statistics, need to understand who is doing the research, who is putting this out, mm -hmm. because a lot of that will also go into, you know, the idea of 
is this truly true? Or, you know, is there some wiggle room here because this person has an agenda that they need to push forward? And Neil Shenby, you know, gives an example of what he would call like an institutionalized racism with abortion, you know, with mm -hmm. Margaret Sanger being famously racist. And and there there are quotes from her about wanting to actually, you know, get rid of black babies. And so, you yeah. know, with that, you have like this idea of institutionalized racism. Talk, you know, if you will, too, I think, you know, one thing we were talking about is that I realized, too, that as I as I've sort of become more aware of these conversations, there's been a lot of history that I, I haven't heard about. You know, I in my school, it's like we got the slavery, we got, uh, you know, the maybe some something about Harriet Tubman and, you know, the Civil War and then Abraham Lincoln and then civil rights moving into Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks. And that's about it, you know? Yeah. And obviously there's, there's a lot more to black history that a lot of white people have never learned. And, and so one thing I've really been trying to do is, is read more about that so that I can, you know, start from a place of empathy so that, you know, when I have brothers and sisters who are in pain over something to realize that when they, you know, we're all getting the same information, we're all getting the same, uh, you know, news and all this, but there's probably in, in, in some case, they're filtering it through a larger historical context that I might not even be aware of. And so, um, you know, just for myself, just trying to start from that place of, of empathy to understand. I think understanding is so important. Yes, I will say this, first of all, um, is that, or not first of all, first off, is that yes, we want to empathize, but we also want truth. Yes. So one of the things that I do appreciate about CRT is the fact that many social justice warriors and people who uphold CRT are looking to augment you know, some of this history. They, they want to bring a more fuller narrative to history. But what they will do is promote all of the slave narrative. Mm. But that isn't necessarily exactly true. There was a whole movement called the Freedmen. They, um, the people who, you know, first came here as indentured servants and didn't necessarily go into slavery. And so how do we talk about that? How do we talk about the abolitionists who also participated, who were white, who participated in helping to free the slaves? Mm. You know, there's... There is a fuller history that we that Americans need to know. And I'll say black and white. When I grew up, you know, learning history and things like that, yes, I had, I, I would say, a, probably a more robust African American history um, time than maybe white people did, but that was because I had black teachers. Mm. But, you know, by and large, you know, when I think about my nephews who are just, you know, in the suburbs now learning about black history, they don't get the the black history that I got. And so I think as, as a nation, we could know more about not just black history, but the history of our nation. America's history is a little sketchy, you know, yeah, like yeah. we can be clear on that. Yeah. We, we, we can really can, that. but, yeah. but we don't need to necessarily demean anybody over it either. Like how can, how can I understand history and not slander someone over it? Mm, yeah. So I wanted to say that. Um, and then now, see, I completely missed what I was supposed to talk about. I'm going to put that out there. <laughs> can, okay. can you just, you know, give me that, you can just give me that tea up one more time. <laughs> I'm not even sure. I think I was just talking about, you know, starting from a place of empathy to try to understand where other people are coming from. Um, because again, I'm, one of my things that I've been really praying about and trying to do is avoid all these extremes, but at the same time, this critical race theory is like sweeping in and I'm, I'm literally watching it just swallow the church up in just a matter of a few days. And I, I don't think it's an exaggeration, and I'll ask you about this, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that this, this is really battling for the soul of the church because you have this narrative going on where, I mean, there are going to be people calling us racist for even having this conversation like we are. Yes. And, and yes, you've yes. already gotten and some it, of that. If they just stopped at racist, I'd be okay. Right. But it's the other words that come in that kind of oh. get me. Oh, man. Well, and that's the thing. That's the thing about critical race theory. Built into its infrastructure is the idea that if you oppose the idea, it's because it's not based on objective truth. It's mm -hmm. based on... Uh, uh, it's based on the standpoint of the people expressing the thoughts. And so if you express any disagreement with the the sort of orthodoxy of critical race theory built into it are all of the uh, the ways to to 
to move you out of the conversation. So if I, as a white woman say, well, actually, I don't think that's true. Well, that's just my white fragility. You know, mm -hmm. if, if I, if I would maybe as a white woman share something with you, well, I'm just exercising my white privilege over you. And so, so built into it is this idea that you can't disagree with it. And I've seen this, like it breaks my heart, Monique, what I'm seeing on Twitter. I just today, I watched someone who's very well known call another evangelical pastor who, you know, is, is kind of cranky sometimes, <laughs> but call him a white supremacist, not saying, mm -hmm. he wasn't saying, oh, he's influenced by that or he needs to be careful. It was like, don't forget this person's a white supremacist because yeah. this person had an opinion that differed from the CRT narrative. And that breaks my heart. That is not of God. That is slander. That is a sin. Yep. And that's what critical race theory doesn't allow for is, for, is for anyone to have an opinion that goes against the narrative. And yes. I've seen it happen. There, there are several, I mean, there are, again, I'm not talking about the loudest voices on each side. I'm talking about dear, sweet, you know, Christian people who are not tied in with a political party. They're not just trying to promote one platform or the other, but they're saying, hey, this isn't right. You know, we can't let this, this change our gospel. We can't let this, you know, circumvent or subvert the gospel. And, and black brothers and sisters who are saying those things are getting called horrible names. And they're then, you know, of course, built into that critical race theory, then they're being told, oh, well, you know, it's you're you're submitting to the whiteness. You need to repent of whiteness now because the yes. whiteness is the enemy. And, yes. and this is so not of God. It's not. It is such a divisive framework mm -hmm. and it is so doing its job. Like the to me, the goal, the spiritual goal of critical theory, critical race theory is to divide mm. and it is doing its job. And especially within the church, yeah. we have grabbed hold of this or not we, but I'll say many people have grabbed hold of this divisive framework and there's no room to let go. There's no room for anyone to speak different and say, you know, actually I believe this or what about this verse? How do you um, how do you think about this verse in light of all the things that you're saying about whites or about blacks? There's no room for that. It's either you are with me or you're not. And if you're not, then I'm going to cancel you. We can't go any further in this relationship. My friends on Facebook are literally like posting memes with uh, like people holding scissors and they're talking about, you know, I'm going to cut off anybody who doesn't agree with me. Mm -hmm. And it's so sad because a lot of times I don't agree. Yeah. Being, yeah, being cut off is something that I feel like should be expected if you hold my position, mm -hmm. because people who, who hold to critical theory or critical race theory, they're committed to this idea that, you know, you can't, there's, there's no other truth aside from the truth that they hold. Mm -hmm. So you've talked with Krista on your podcast about what you're calling a new canon, and, you know, of course, referencing the canon of scripture, we have the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Gospels, all of this. And so with, with critical race theory, and again, all, we're not arguing that there's no problem. We're not saying racism doesn't exist or there's not a way for Christians to talk about uh, pursuing justice in every way. You know, let the justice roll, yes. Um, but but there's this, this new canon that you're talking about. Talk a little bit about what you mean by that, because I, I'm seeing a lot of people saying, okay, what can I do? Like, like, especially white Christians who maybe this is the first time they're really thinking about these issues very seriously. And they're saying, what can I do? You know, give me some recommendations. And then you're seeing kind of the same books be recommended. Talk a little bit about that. Oh my gosh. And if people don't know the what the books are that are being like recommended, if you don't know the damage that they can do, it's going to be traumatic. So when we say a new canon, we're talking about the books that are being recommended so that white people can either divest themselves of their whiteness or understand the plight of people of color. You get things like white fragility that talks about um, why white people are, you know, either afraid or averse to talking about racism, um, divided by faith why, you know, there's like the black church and the white church and the division that lies within that. Uh, why do all the black kids sit together in the cafeteria? Uh, Jamar Tisby's The Co Color of Compromise, Woke Church by Eric Mason, 
um, my goodness, even even things that are considered more of racial reconciliation. So you have um, Latasha Morrison's Bridge Builders. Be, oh, yeah, not be, Bridge Builders. Be the Bridge. Um, you know, what does that look like? So in, in this small group, it's a small group study, but they have like a big Facebook group and things like that. And, you know, anyone can join. It doesn't matter what your ethnicity is, you can join. But if you are white, you can't always speak. There's a ton of homework that needs to be done by black and white. And the first three months, no one speaks. So it doesn't matter what your color is. But let's say I'm on month, I'm on, you know, like day three months and one day. And now I can finally speak because, you know, I've been in here long enough and I post something. As a woman of color, I can post. No white person can speak on this. Hmm. And, or, you know, no white voice should be added. Hmm. That, you know, it is it, it needs to decenter the whiteness. That's not Christian. Christ doesn't doesn't um, hush us, you know, or decenter any part of us based on the color of our skin. Mm -hmm. He will tell us you need to decenter your your pride, yeah, and maybe center humility, you know, but decenter your anger, you know, center your love. But he isn't decentering anything about us based on the color of our skin. And you, were it a part really, of that group, right? You a were, lot of these books. In... Go ahead. You were in that group for a while, is that right? Yeah, I was in that group. Yeah. So go I'm and, sorry, go ahead, continue. No, I was just going to say, you know, it it really is about to me flipping what happened during the civil rights time to now. So, you know, the way that that blacks either couldn't do certain things, we couldn't, you know, give a voice we didn't have a voice about this we couldn't necessarily give our opinion about that or um you know we felt marginalized and you know people today still feel marginalized things happen and people say you know what they pushed me to the edge but i'll i'll, I'll say that in a minute you know like they pushed us to the edge that is i think the feeling that some people that hold to critical race theory want white people to feel not understanding that this is a heart issue. Mm. There, from the beginning of time, have been issues with, you know, partiality. And until the Lord comes back, there will be issues with partiality. We need to figure out in the church, how do I deal with my brother or my sister who may look different than me in a way that is compassionate and empathetic and loving? Mm. Not, you know, how can I go out into culture and pick up what culture is doing and bring that into the church? That's how CRT got into the church. It was someone who went out into culture and said, oh, look what culture's doing. Let me bring that in. That's killing us. Mm. It's like the poison. Wow. It's a powerful word. So just a question, like in, in the group that you're talking about, the, the Be the Bridge group, let's say that there's someone who is has a white mother and a black father, and then somebody posts no white voices. Where do they fit on there? That's a good question. I guess it is with the what if ethnicity they're really that you and they don't look you tend to. Yeah, I didn't hear you. What'd you say? Well, what if they're like, what if they have like a one parent is black and one parent is white, but they have really light skin, and let's say they kind of look white, but they actually are not, you know, one hundred percent Caucasian. Like when it says no white voices, do they just have to kind of decide for themselves if that includes them, or or how does that work? You know, I really don't know. I, I haven't seen that, but I think that one of the things that um, critical race theory does is it, it tells you you have to choose a side. Mm. So if you're biracial, I think a lot of people who are biracial feel that tension of like, Ugh, I don't know which side to go to because if I choose this side, then I'm obviously going to be turning away from the other side. How do you, I turn away from the other parent, mm. you know? But that is, that is critical theory. Mm. It's oppressed and oppressor. Yeah. And it, at some point, you're going to have to choose the side that you're going to stand on. Yeah. Do you know of any books that you would recommend for people who are really wanting a, a biblical way forward? I mean, is there? I mean, I know your books. Your book's coming out. You've got a book that you've contributed your story to that's coming out, and I actually have uh, an endorser copy. And can I just tell you? Like I have highlighted that thing up and down. I mean, it is, it's been it so is fire. I will say that helpful. It is such a great book and it's called, um, confronting injustice without compromising truth. Is that right? That's the title. Yes. And confronting injustice without compromising truth. The 12 qu questions 
every Christian should ask about critical race theory. So we'll so we'll be looking for that one coming out as we come to a close here. Monique, just what what would your advice be? Because I know I know I'm just like I'm thinking about so many hearts right now. There are people, there there are white Christians who are thinking I don't want to regret, you know, not standing how I should have. Like, I know that there were some evangelicals that expressed regret for not standing with Martin Luther King. Like, like speak to that. But, you know, this is the thing that, that I just keep thinking about. As I was, you know, listening and as I was sort of slow, you know, quick to listen, slow to speak was what I was trying to do for the first few days of this thing, you know, and, and that's that's fine. And, and I think that people need to understand that's okay. Like, you don't have to post something within 30 seconds you know, mm-hmm. the world can cancel you all day long. You know, Jesus isn't going to cancel you. If you've put your <laughs> your faith and your trust in Jesus and you're part of his body, you're not going to be canceled with him. You better preach. Come on. Okay. I'm going to go now. No. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's the thing. And so so putting our knowing that Jesus promised that there, there would be all kinds of craziness. But, you know, I think that's a very real fear. Like, that's something I've thought about. Like, I don't want in, in 30 years to go, man, I should have done X and I didn't. Uh, maybe speak to that a little bit as we close out here. So uh, the first thing I'll say is that we should all be praying. Mm -hmm. If we aren't praying, then we're not going to know what we should do. And I think that's what you see in culture. Like, I don't know how much culture is really praying about what they should be doing. Mm -hmm. Um, and, And that's a problem because truly scripture and Jesus, like there, there are answers there. Um, and when it comes to things like, should I post this? Should I protest? Should I, you, you need to get into a conversation with Holy Spirit about that. Get in get into a prayerful conversation about what God would have you do. I would also say though, that we don't shame one another. Mm, so if mm. you feel like your prayers are leading you to slander or shame someone else, you might want to check the scriptures. Mm. You might want to ask the Lord to, you know, confirm that word. Cause there's something wrong because it doesn't align with scripture. It doesn't align with, with Christ's um, actions here on earth. And let me see, there was one more thing that I was thinking. Um, What was it? I would say that we should figure out a way to stand for humanity. Mm. Like, yes, black lives matter. I'm black. Like, yes, (laughs) I think black lives matter. And I also know that humanity, like lives matter. Mm -hmm. Christ is concerned and compelled for all life. And even if, you know, there's injustice coming over here, there's also injustice over here. How can I stand for truth? How can I stand for justice for people? So, yeah, I don't know. That's, those are the the thoughts that right on the, right on the top of my head. Um, I would, I would say like, don't, don't fall into the pressure of, I have to post something, otherwise I'm going to be canceled. Mm-hmm. I have to post something to prove I'm not racist. I don't, I don't know that that's how God operates. Like that's that seems so legalistic to me. Like, like a social legalism. Mm-hmm. I have to be doing this in order to be considered good, or I have to be doing this in order to prove my, you know, my goodness or my right standing or you know my anti-racism. I, I don't. I would say question that question mm-hmm. and don't fall into shame. Black people, if you hold a view that all lives matter, or people, not even black people, but but people of color, if you hold this view of all lives matter, or you hold a view that cr- critical race theory is not the way, and people start to shame you, know that you are not shamed by God. That is not his view of you. And white people, if you feel like all lives matter and you don't uphold critical race theory, or you don't want to post something, don't fall into the the idea that you are now have to be shamed or fear of being canceled. Because just like Elisa said, God is not going to cancel you. I think we as Christians need to start speaking out to Christians a little bit more, mm-hmm. because what Christians are doing is we're listening to culture, mm-hmm. and that's putting shame on us. That is not right. We have to first listen to Christ. What are we saying in the church? Why are pastors not addressing this more? Mm-hmm. Well, we'll be praying that they will, that, that, you know, I, and I think this maybe comes down to what the end goal is, because I think when a lot of people are talking past each other, you know, Christians should be coming at this like, we, we want unity. 
We want yeah. reconciliation, but that's not what critical race theory wants. Critical race theory wants, as Neil Shenvey, I heard him say this on a podcast the other day, critical race theory doesn't want unity and reconciliation. It wants a revolution. It wants to upend yeah. everything. And uh, so just encouragement for, you, for Christians who are trying to figure this out, you know, listen, learn, do, do all that stuff, but rest in Christ. You're not going to get canceled by Jesus. And, and if you, and, and this is the great thing about Christianity too, Monique, is that even if you do the wrong thing, even if you don't post and you should have, or you should have gone to the protest and you didn't, we are covered by the grace of God and there's yeah. forgiveness for that. And there's always an opportunity to come to God in repentance and ask forgiveness for anything that we've done that offended him and his holiness. And, and so just rest in that uh, for people who are listening and watching and uh, go to Monique's website, the Center for Biblical, <laughs> it's hard to say that, the Center, is it a mouthful? <laughs> the Center for Biblical Unity.com. And there's also a Facebook group, the Center for yes. Biblical Unity that you can check out. I'm a member there too. So um, thanks so much. And we'll talk soon. All right. Thanks. Thank you so much for tuning in today. If you enjoyed listening to or watching this podcast, you can go to alisachilders.com and click the subscribe button, or you can subscribe on YouTube or iTunes or wherever it is that you're listening to this podcast. Don't forget to go to patreon.com slash alisachilders and take a look at some of the ways that you can come alongside us financially and with your prayers to help get the message out to more people. Have a great week.